What if the Yellowstone supervolcano erupted? Everyone loves a good apocalypse video, right? I know I do. Welcome back to Hypotheticals, everyone. There are a lot more of you here than last time. Thank you all very much for 1,500 subscribers. I'm seriously still in shock over all the support. I may do some fun stuff to celebrate, but I don't quite have anything finalized yet. If there's anything you want to see me do, let me know. Comments, go type, you don't know, do what you do. I, I reply to most of them, so let me know. Today, we're talking about Yellowstone National Park. When you first think of this place, you probably think Yosemite, Old Faithful, Buffalo, yada, yada, yada. You you get the idea. Anyways, what many people might not know is that Yellowstone hides a pretty big secret. Underneath all that pretty nature lies a giant field of magma. Actually, two giant fields of magma. And when I say giant, I mean giant. Let's take a look at this handy dandy chart real quick, courtesy of the University of Utah. As you can see, we've got two magma fields to worry about. The shallower one, known as the Rhyolite Partial Melt, is estimated by the United States Geological Survey to be anywhere between 3 to 10 miles deep and 25 to 55 miles wide. In other words, it's freaking massive. Then there's the deeper one. This deeper chamber is about 4.5 times larger than the upper chamber. It's only about 2% melt, meaning the vast majority of the stuff inside of it is solid rock, but it's still got quite a lot of magma down there. In other words, scary stuff. Before we get into the impact of this massive eruption though, let's first examine the history of this supervolcano, because it has erupted before, and it will erupt again. I hope you were able to read that title card in time. If not, go back. It's okay, don't worry, I won't be mad, I promise. You can even go back and pause to read it again if you want. That's cool too. Okay, let's get into it. First off, what even is a supervolcano? According to the USGS, the survey group I just mentioned, a supervolcano is a volcanic center that has had an eruption of magnitude 8 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index, also known as the VEI. There are a few things we need to break down here. First off, what is the VEI? I want you to think of this as basically a measurement system of how strong volcanic eruptions eruptions are. You know how earthquakes are measured in magnitudes? Volcanic eruptions are the same way. Alright, so now that we know what the VEI measures, how does its measurement system work? This is also, luckily, pretty simple. The magnitude given to an eruption simply depends on its tephra volume, which is just how much material erupts out of the volcano and into the atmosphere. Magnitude 1 volcanic eruptions are bounded by anywhere between 0 0.0001 cubic kilometers and 0 0.001 cubic kilometers of material. In other words, not that much. Magnitude 8 eruptions are how we get supervolcanoes. These are eruptions that release over 1,000 cubic kilometers of material into the atmosphere. In other words, a lot of stuff gets thrown into the air. And that's where we get back to Yellowstone. It's had a magnitude 8 eruption in its past, therefore it's classified as a supervolcano. But Yellowstone isn't the only supervolcano in existence. In fact, there are currently 20 known supervolcanoes on Earth, some of which have played a pretty big role in human history. For example, about 70,000 years ago, the Lake Toba supervolcano erupted, and it's possible that this resulted in a huge population loss for modern humans. At some point around this time, the Homo sapien population on Earth, that's us, we're Homo sapien dropped to just a few thousand. It's long been thought that the Lake Toba eruption is the reason why that happened. We also know where this volcano is and where it erupted, at Lake Toba in Indonesia. You want to know how we know? Because the crater left by this eruption formed the actual lake I'm referring to. This is how big the lake is for reference. So yeah, that gives you an idea of how catastrophic these eruptions can be. But let's move on from Lake Toba. There are plenty of other supervolcanoes to talk about. Unfortunately, I can't address them all though. The most recent supervolcano eruption occurred around 27,000 years ago in New Zealand, and they don't erupt too often. However, that hasn't stopped other supervolcanoes from making headlines in recent weeks, as residents who live near the Campy Flegri supervolcano have experienced an increasing number of earthquakes in the past few months, a classic sign that the volcano beneath them may be waking up. That's for another video though. Let's now finally get back to the Yellowstone supervolcano. The current Yellowstone caldera, which is the depression that Yellowstone National Park sits in today, was formed around 700,000 years ago when the Yellowstone supervolcano last had a magnitude 8 eruption. Its last lava flows occurred around 70,000 thousand years ago, and those formed the modern Pitchstone Plateau in the southwest corner of the park. Okay, enough with the history. I hope I haven't overloaded you with too much info. Some scientists say that the Yellowstone supervolcano is overdue for an eruption. If that's actually true, why hasn't it erupted yet? Let's now get into why you're all really watching this video and force this thing to erupt.
I'm going to start this portion of the video by giving you some very good news. If a cataclysmic eruption of Yellowstone were to occur, it wouldn't just happen out of nowhere. Instead, there would be quite a few warning signs. Remember how I mentioned that those living near Campi Flegri in Italy have experienced an increasing number of earthquakes in recent months? That exact thing would happen with Yellowstone as the magma beneath the surface shifts around more and more. Also, quick sidebar, I'm not saying that Campi Flegri in Italy is going to have a super volcanic eruption anytime soon. Don't freak out, we're not on the cusp of the apocalypse. Just because there are earthquakes doesn't mean that it's going to spew out a ton of ash and lava and kill a ton of people. That's not what that means. It could have a very small eruption, it could be big, but it's very unlikely to be cataclysmic. You got it? To be completely honest, volcanoes and earthquakes are intertwined in a way that I don't fully understand. So let me simplify this explanation as much as possible. When liquid rock beneath surface shift, ground around liquid rock also move. That's what can lead to more frequent earthquakes. There's obviously more to that explanation than what I just said, but that's the gist of it. If you want to read more about that, feel free to check out my sources in the description. Now back to Yellowstone. It's very possible that earthquakes beneath Yellowstone could mean that only a small eruption is coming. For the purpose of this video, we're going to assume that Yellowstone erupts with a force not seen in nearly 700,000 years, when it had its last super volcanic eruption. I hope you're ready, let's get into it. In the months leading up to the eruption, Yellowstone and its surrounding areas are rocked by earthquakes that increase in both frequency and severity. Then, one day, boom! Cracks begin to splinter in the ground. Magma rushes to the surface with enough force to create a massive crater. It's catastrophic, and it also made a very loud noise. This eruption is being measured as a magnitude 8 on the VEI, which is 100 times stronger than the Mount Krakatoa eruption of 1883. That eruption is specifically known for producing the loudest natural sound in recorded history. Basically what I'm saying is that neighbors around Yellowstone are very much aware of what just happened. And if they didn't somehow hear it, well, they're seeing the effects. Not long after the eruption, ash begins to rain down on the continental United States. And luckily, we've got a lovely map that estimates how much ash we can expect. For reference, there are actually four maps to choose from and the models were produced based on the time of year. I'm just going to be using a culmination of the four. So as you can see, a good chunk of the northwest corner of the United States is pretty much screwed based on this estimate. Portions of Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana will be buried under about three feet of ash. If warnings aren't heeded prior to the main eruption and evacuations don't take place, it's very possible that hundreds of thousands of people would die right after and in the days following the eruption. Eruption. The ash will spread too, obviously. Almost immediately after the eruption, the United States government declares a state of emergency, but this won't do much to stop the public from panicking. Air travel across the country is shut down. Communication systems are disrupted. People lose power. As dark clouds spread across the country and ash rains down on North America, rioting and looting begins to occur as more panic spreads. This might seem like an exaggeration as to what might happen, but I promise you it's not. Think about it. The only two places in the U.S. that won't even see a small amount of ash are the southern tip of Texas and the southern tip of Florida. Everywhere else will have toxic remnants from the eruption rain down on them. This toxic air will lead to flooded hospitals as people breathe it in. Patients under respiratory distress, meaning they're having trouble breathing, will flood emergency rooms across the country. All of that will be the least of the government's concerns though. Economically, the country is now a mess. The eruption has sent stocks spiraling and food prices are through the roof because the supply chain now faces a massive disruption. People lose their jobs and can't eat. What do they do now? There's not much to do but try to survive. Out Outside of the United States, allies look to aid the hurting country. Care packages come in from across Europe and beyond in an effort to supply food and resources to those who need it most. Those other countries might want to hang on to their food though, because it's very possible that this eruption is going to have consequences on a global scale. But we'll get to that more in a bit. While some countries aim to help a crippled America, other countries see it as an opportunity. I'm not a foreign affairs expert by any means, but something tells me that countries like Russia and China would see something like this occur and take every opportunity to take advantage of it. The US will be stressed super thin. So maybe China tries to invade Taiwan while this is all happening. Who knows? It absolutely could be outlandish for me to even mention that, but I like to have fun here on this channel. I hope you do too and we can have fun together. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is that while some countries around the world would be trying to help the United States, because they'll absolutely be needing help, other countries will try to take advantage of them while they're hurting. Governments in Russia and China may see the US government looking elsewhere and try to use it to their advantage. Like I said, I'm no foreign affairs expert, but does that make sense? It kind of makes sense to me. I could just be an idiot though. Okay, that's enough for the short-term impacts of the eruption. While the United States will be the country most impacted by a Yellowstone eruption, it'll be far from the only one. With that in mind, let's now jump into how this thing could impact the entire globe. Music 
Remember when I mentioned earlier that other countries may not want to give a ton of food to the United States? This now comes into play again as we talk about how a Yellowstone eruption could impact the entire globe. First though, some more history. April 10th, 1815 was a normal day on Earth, but the eruption of Mount Tambora changed that. The eruption of Mount Tambora is the strongest volcanic eruption that has occurred in the past 10,000 years. It came in as a magnitude 7 on the VEI, meaning it ejected at least 100 cubic kilometers of ash and debris into the atmosphere. It killed thousands of people, but that was only the beginning. The year following the Mount Tambora eruption, 1816, is commonly known to historians today as the year without a summer. You might be thinking, what does that mean? Well, the name is pretty self-explanatory. Many places around the world saw record cold temperatures. The northern hemisphere was heavily impacted. Europe basically froze over. It didn't actually, that's an exaggeration. However, summer temperatures in Europe were the lowest on record between the years 1766 and 2000. Look at this chart. Look how cold France got. That does not look fun. These colder than normal temperatures brought along quite a bit of chaos. Summer in the northern hemisphere is typically hot, which means this is when crops are grown. These cold temps meant that crops did not grow well, which led to numerous famines and food shortages. Additionally, multiple epidemics occurred due in part to the lower temperatures. So what caused all of this? Well, it was none other than that pesky Mount Tambora eruption the year prior. Turns out that the eruption had ejected so much debris into the atmosphere that global temperatures decreased by anywhere between 0.7 to 1 degrees Fahrenheit. In other words, the Mount Tambora eruption triggered a volcanic winter. But Mr. Stickman, what's a volcanic winter? You really think I'm not going to answer that? I am. Just calm down. A volcanic winter occurs when volcanoes send tons of volcanic ash and other debris into the atmosphere, specifically the stratosphere. A specific kind of debris, known as sulfur aerosols, absorb incoming solar radiation which cools the area below. As a result of this whole process, temperatures drop on Earth's surface, basically because not as much sunlight is reaching the surface. I hope that makes sense to you. With that definition in mind, let's now get back to Yellowstone. As a quick reminder, Mount Tambora was a magnitude 7 eruption on the VEI. Our Yellowstone eruption will be a magnitude 8, meaning it's ejecting at least 10 times more material into the atmosphere than Mount Tambora did in 1815. What happens now is something very difficult to prepare for. Immediately following the eruption, much of the Midwestern United States, where most of its crops are grown, was covered in ash. That meant that any food supply coming from there was poisoned, and so was the soil, so crops were struggling to grow. We've kind of been over that already. The summer following the Yellowstone eruption, though, temperatures in the northern hemisphere don't reach what they normally do. In the southern hemisphere, they face an even colder winter. Depending on the exact trajectory of the ash, one hemisphere could be more impacted than the other, but it's tough to say. Earth is now in a volcanic winter triggered by the Yellowstone supervolcano eruption. Around the world, crops struggle to grow. Supply chains face an even bigger shortage, and grocery stores and markets are seeing emptier and emptier shelves. We've got food stocked up, but pretty soon, countries around the world are seeing more and more people go hungry. With hunger comes disease, war, and many more bad things. That speculation could take this entire hypothetical down a whole new route. But instead of speculating on that, I want to calm your nerves down a bit. How likely is all of this to actually occur? Let's find out. As I've previously mentioned, the last Yellowstone super eruption came nearly 700,000 years ago. That's a really long time ago. Some scientists also say Yellowstone is overdue for an eruption, but that doesn't mean it's going to be a big one. In fact, the odds of Yellowstone's next eruption being big are extremely low. According to the USGS, the past 20 eruptions at Yellowstone have been lava flows with no significant amounts of ash falling outside of the park. On top of that, the last 60 to 80 eruptions had little regional impact. What I'm trying to say is the odds are in our favor. To make you feel even better though, it's very possible that Yellowstone's next eruption won't even happen in the next few centuries. Geological evidence also suggests that Yellowstone has experienced similar rates of earthquakes and ground uplift, aka the ground moving, over the past 10,000 years. To sum it all up, scientists haven't seen anything out of the ordinary. So don't freak out, okay? I hope you're feeling a little bit better. Let's wrap things up now. Yellowstone will, in all likelihood, erupt again one day. Obviously, a magnitude 8 eruption would be catastrophic to the entire planet, but the odds of that are near zero. Instead, if Yellowstone one day erupts again, it'll probably be pretty small in magnitude. Sure, there may be some lava and some ash, but it wouldn't be anything earth-shattering. Like all of my other videos, this one was all in good fun. It also took me a really long time to make. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to like and subscribe. Additionally, I'm always looking for feedback and ways to improve, so if you've got a piece of advice, a question, or just want to say hi, 
feel free to comment down below. If you want to read more about Yellowstone, all of my research links and sources are in the description. I do all of this research myself, so I might have made a mistake or left something out of this video. If that's the case, I apologize. Like I said, I'm always trying to improve. Okay, that's all I've got for this hypothetical. Thank you again for watching and for all of the recent support. Hope I see you again next time. Thank you.